Good morning. It's Tuesday, October 6, 2015. This is your Morning Edition on I-24 News. Coming up later today, Israeli-Palestinian tensions flare amid a wave of terror attacks and rioting. Russia draws criticism as it continues its aerial attacks in support of the Assad regime in Syria. And later on in the show, we bring you the latest environmental news, including Shell's announcement that it will be ending its oil drilling in the Arctic. Good morning, I'm Meredith Ross, and we begin in the West Bank, where tensions have been flaring up over the past few days amid a series of deadly terror attacks against Israelis and violent clashes between Palestinian protesters and Israeli security forces. Heavy rioting was reported in several West Bank cities yesterday, resulting in the death of a Palestinian teenager. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, under pressure from the right, vowed to crush Palestinian terror, authorizing a series of new security measures. And to hear all about it, we are joined in studio this morning by I-24 News Middle East analyst Ali Wakhed. Good, Good morning. morning, Ali. All right, senior defense correspondent Amir Oren. Good morning, Aradu. Amir. Morning. And I-24 News media analyst Ami Kaufman. Good, Good morning. morning, Ami. Thanks for being with us. But first, let's watch a report wrapping up this weekend's developments. Ongoing clashes between Israeli security forces and Palestinian protesters have spread from their epicenter in Jerusalem's old city into the West Bank a new wave of violence that has raised fears of events spinning out of control. Clashes broke out in the wake of two Jerusalem stabbing attacks on Saturday night that left two Israelis dead and three wounded. Early the next day, Israeli police imposed unprecedented restrictions on Jerusalem, barring non-resident Palestinians from entering the old city for, quote, as long as necessary. Even though I want to go and visit my parents' house, they are not allowing me to enter. I live in Anata in Jerusalem, and it says so in my documents. By Sunday evening, violence had quickly spread. An 18-year-old Palestinian was killed during clashes with Israeli troops at a checkpoint near the northern West Bank city of Tul Karem. On Monday morning, Israeli security forces shot dead a 13-year-old Palestinian near Ida refugee camp just north of Bethlehem. The Palestinian Red Crescent reported hundreds of Palestinians were injured in and around the West Bank, with clashes concentrated in Ramallah, Bethlehem, Jenin, and the Al Arub refugee camp near Hebron. Inside Israel proper, Palestinians held non-violent solidarity rallies in mixed cities across the country. The crisis of conflict is radiating out of the flashpoint Al-Aqsa compound in Jerusalem, which has seen rising tensions since the start of the Jewish holidays two weeks ago. Israeli forces were also on high alert after the murder of a Jewish couple in front of their young children inside the West Bank, an area disputed since the 1967 war. Calls for Palestinian resistance has also sparked rocket fire from the coastal southern enclave of Gaza. One missile fired from the strip struck Israeli territory Sunday night, and another did not make it over the border, exploding inside the territory. Israeli planes struck a number of targets there in response, causing leaders inside the Strip to call for further escalation. We call on all Palestinians and all national and Islamic factions to strengthen this intifada. Though not yet at the level of previous intifadas, Palestinian uprisings, fears are mounting that this wave of violence could trigger a wider, long-term escalation. And let's hear what Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu had to say following the security cabinet meeting last night. I would like to commend the Israeli security authority personnel who solved the terrible murder of the Henkins near Nablus. They acted very quickly and also apprehended the murderers. We are acting with a strong hand against terrorism and against insiders. We are operating on all fronts. We have brought an additional four IDF battalions into Judea and Samaria and thousands of police into Jerusalem. The police are going deeply into the Arab neighborhoods, which has not been done in the past. We will demolish terrorist homes. We are allowing our forces to take strong action against those who throw rocks and firebombs. This is necessary in order to safeguard the security of Israeli citizens. And we're now joined on the phone by Israeli Police Foreign Media spokesman Mickey Rosenfeld. Good morning and thank you for being with us. Now, how tense is the situation on the ground and have the police received emergency orders calling for an increase in personnel in Jerusalem? At the moment, uh, on the ground, as of this morning, there are still thousands of extra police officers in and around the different areas. And I'm talking about the uh, Israeli Arab neighborhood, Isawiya, Silwan, and uh, other various areas, with emphasis also on the old city. All of these measures are being implemented in order to prevent any further attacks. 
as well as deal with local disturbances and riots, which we dealt with overnight as well. No police officers were injured, but our main emphasis and aim is to protect and prevent further attacks or riots from taking place in the different areas. And regarding these attacks, how do you cope with these specific lone wolf attacks when they're almost impossible to predict? And also, how do you min minimize casualties while trying to keep the peace? Well, over the last 48 hours, the uh, old city itself was closed only to residents. That's why this morning there's still hundreds of extra police officers specifically in and around the different walkways and areas preventing any attacks from taking place. But at the same time, our intelligence and our different units are working in order to find potential terrorists. And these operations will continue as long as necessary. Well, thank you very much for these updates. Mickey Rosenfeld, police spokesman. And uh, we're bringing it back now to studio. Ali, we'll go to you. He mentioned uh, Isawiya Silwan. These are East Jerusalem neighborhoods. Uh, and, and we've heard from sources from our Arabic channel here at I-24 News that this is just a ticking time bomb, these areas. What's it going to take and when, until it's too late in a situation Mary, like this? I don't know if you have been into these uh, uh, neighborhoods. In the United Capital of Israel, there are areas that are more similar to uh, the uh, most miserable neighborhoods in the uh, in the third world. These are uh, uh, people that don't have any uh, uh, access to uh, services. They are not allowed uh, to build houses. They don't receive uh, easily uh, uh, licenses from the Israelis to uh, to build. They feel uh, in between the Palestinians and in the uh, and the uh, Israelis. On the uh, other hand, with uh, the building of the uh, Israelis in Abu Dis, in uh, Sheikh Jarrah. And uh, um, in, in Silwan, they feel that they are uh, uh, putting to the uh, margins more, more than they are. And with the cocktail that, with the change of the status quo, or what they feel, this is the change of the, the status quo, plus a political party, the Islamic movement in Israel, Hamas, that are incest, inc inciting, mm -hmm. this is the uh, cocktail that uh, bring this, uh, uh, this explosion. Uh, and I think there is a conceptual uh, mistake. The spokesperson of the police defines them as the Arab-Israeli uh, uh, neighborhoods. There is a very small problem that themselves, they don't define themselves as Arab Israelis. Right. They think that they are Palestinians. They should be part of the Palestinian uh, entity, the Palestinian uh, uh, state. And it's time that the uh, Israelis understand that the mayor of Jerusalem cannot be uh, a left, w a right wing uh, uh, politician uh, uh, accusing its own, uh, his mm -hmm. own uh, uh, citizens in being uh, terrorists, etc. And on the other hand, not giving them the minimum of of the services that the uh, Western uh, neighborhood citizens of, of Jerusalem uh, receive and expect them to keep uh, uh, quiet when they feel that there is some change in the uh, most uh, holy uh, sites for the Muslim, which is the Al-Aqsa. Well, Ali, thank you for this. We will be coming back to studio in just a few moments. But now we go live to Jerusalem, where I-24 News diplomatic correspondent Tal Shalev is standing by in front of the prime minister's residence, the site of yesterday's right-wing rally. Good morning, Tal. So tell us about what was discussed at the emergency security cabinet meeting last night. Well, it was a very long meeting. It was actually a five-hour meeting. It lasted almost till the uh, till three o'clock in the morning. And uh, um, at the end of the meeting, the government does announce a series of steps and measures um, that have been decided upon in order to combat the recent wave of terror. Uh, most notably, Netanyahu has instructed to expedite and speed up house demolition procedures but also he instructed to continue security forces reinforcement in the West Bank and in Jerusalem. He has authorized uh, Israeli policemen to uh, act deep inside East Jerusalem neighborhoods. He has directed and instructed to, uh, to build bypass roads in the West Bank for Jewish settlers. But most notably, probably we can say that the, uh, uh, most of the meeting was dedicated not to discussing the measures but actually to political bickering, as Netanyahu is facing enormous pressure from within his own camp, members of uh, his only Likud party and also members of the Jewish Home Party, the right-wing uh, coalition partner, but members of his only Likud party and uh, have been calling uh, for, much, for a much tougher hand and a much more decisive action in retaliation to this recent wave of terror. And actually, while the cabinet meeting was going on, Three of Netanyahu's only Likud party ministers were here outside his house, joining thousands of uh, right-wing demonstrators, uh, um, criticizing Netanyahu and calling on him to show a much more tougher hand in his fight against terror. So how does Netanyahu then deal with that pressure? Because although he's vowed to be tough on terror, he has to tread carefully. 
Well, Netanyahu understands, uh, you're, you're right, Meredith, Netanyahu is in a very delicate situation. On the one hand, he has, a, um, he has political considerations that he has to uh, be aware of. And yes, uh, um, the people that are protesting against him are his own constituency, his own political base. Um, they, uh, if you can see just behind me, there's a camp out here, um, here outside um, Netanyahu's residence. It's been here since Friday. And uh, um, it's uh, basically, it's uh, the le uh, leaders of the settler movement uh, who have been camping out here demanding Netanyahu uh, um, 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 expand security measures for West Bank residents and uh, announce new uh, settlement construction plans in retaliation to the recent uh, uh, terror attacks. And Netanyahu tried to meet with them yesterday and tried to talk with them, but it wasn't a successful meeting. And at the end of the meeting, the leaders of the settler movement do say that they will continue to camp out here until Netanyahu concedes to their demands. And at this moment, besides um, having numerous uh, um, security consultations and security meetings and announcing these steps, which most of them, by the way, are not new steps, Netanyahu can only continue to try and demonstrate leadership by giving harsh statements, as we have been hearing in the past few days. Tal Shalev, thank you very much for joining us from Jerusalem. So, Amir Oren, uh, you're here with us in studio. I want to continue with that, that, that idea that Netanyahu is in a really, really tough place. He's between a rock and a hard place, uh, as we say. So, so how does he move forward? Uh, he, he can make harsh statements and threats, but he has to be extremely careful with actions on the ground. Let me take exception to uh, one of your lines. It's uh, just like uh, one hand clapping. He's between a rock and nothing, hmm. because there is no real opposition, there is no one uh, left of uh, Netanyahu, or even in the center parties like Yair Lapid, who will now uh, place a vote of no confidence and challenge the right wing to bring down the Netanyahu government. And um, Netanyahu uh, just came back from uh, New York. The, uh, what happened uh, over the last few days, both in the West Bank and in Jerusalem, erased whatever impact his um, UN General Assembly speech uh, had. And the common denominator between what happened in New York and what is happening on the ground is that Netanyahu is leaving the initiative to others, yeah. be it uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Barack Obama, all those people on the ground, the Palestinian youth, who, um, who see no future in the uh, status quo. Now, you don't really have a wave of terror. What you have um, are specific incidents one after another, it would have been easier for the security forces had there been hundreds of demonstrators to uh, tackle. Mm -hmm. They know how to do that, riot police and, and uh, other measures. But if you uh, have one day a single person, a lone wolf, as you said, then the next day another one, and this is unpredictable, you can't have closures and you can't have a surge, much like you had in, in Iraq a few years ago. You can't have a surge of security forces for a long time. This is just a stopgap measure. Nothing basic is being done in order to change the situation. Mm -hmm. And Ali, uh, we've also seen uh, the Islamic, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad group uh, has claimed responsibilities for some of these attacks, as is common after attacks happen. Many of these groups claim responsibility. Uh, but they've also released a video, uh, a short clip showing a uh, construction of a suicide bomb, threatening suicide bombings at this point. So it's a question that many people are wondering, could this be the beginning of the Third Intifada? The Islamic Jihad, of course, and, the, and Hamas are interested that uh, there will be a third intifada mm -hmm. only if it happens in the West Bank and mm -hmm. East Jerusalem and not in the, uh, in the Gaza Strip. Yeah. You should pay attention to one point that the Palestinian organizations, Hamas and Islamic Jihad, claim that the perpetrators of the uh, last uh, two attacks were members of Hamas and the Islamic Jihad, but they did not claim that they carry out the uh, attacks on behalf of the uh, Hamas or the uh, uh, Islamic mm -hmm. uh, Jihad, which means that for the moment, these Islamic Jihad and other factions in the Gaza Strip are still committed to the understandings with Hamas that they will keep uh, calm or ceasefire with Israel as uh, the Gaza Strip is uh, concerned, and they will uh, try to incite uh, violence in the in the West Bank. But I heard the, the statement of uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. If the Palestinian Authority did not take the measures that it is taking, including in the last hours, against networks of Hamas and the uh, Islamic Jihad, the situation uh, would be 
be uh, 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 much more uh, uh, significant. The Palestinian Authority, in spite of all the political and diplomatic uh, tension, is taking uh, measures, and the Palestinians were those who um, gave a sign, like like a senior officer, Palestinian senior officer, told me, gave a sign to the uh, Israelis who might be those uh, under the the attack that was uh, uh, carried out in uh, in the region of Nablus uh, three four days ago, which means that still the uh, security coordination is maintained, but the question is until when the Fatah will have the motivation to coordinate with Israel and to collaborate with Israel with inside the uh, Fatah, with inside the uh, PLO organizations and even with inside the PLO uh, um, uh, executive uh, committee. Yesterday there was a statement by Fatah against a leader of another small Palestinian faction who is a member of the executive committee of the PLO, which is the government of all the Palestinian organization that criticized Abbas for his incapacity uh, to deal with the challenges that Netanyahu is presenting in front of the uh, Palestinians, mm -hmm. which means that with inside his own house, Abu Mazen is facing uh, pressure. Palestinian security men are facing uh, pressure from their uh, environment not to uh, not to collaborate. And the question is, Tal said that Netanyahu is in a very delicate situation, as is Araf, uh, uh, Abu Mazen. He is also in a very uh, delicate uh, situation. The question is, until when he will be able uh, to put pressure over his uh, security uh, man to try to control the situation. Very good. By the way, a few days ago, right after the murder of the couple, the Hankin couple, Netanyahu blamed Mahmoud Abbas for inciting yeah. uh, the population. Now that uh, the uh, squad uh, has been caught, it is very easy for the Israeli security forces to interrogate and find out whether there was any connection between uh, Abbas's uh, speech at the UN and what they planned and carried out. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, there was no such connection because they are affiliated uh, with Hamas. And uh, there is um, um, an inherent contradiction in Netanyahu's position, because if Abbas is so powerful that a few words of his can um, give the uh, population uh, an impetus to go out and uh, demonstrate, he can also turn it back. Obviously, this is not so, and uh, Abbas must be given some some leeway, some uh, political leeway, in order to, to uh, cool uh, the situation, to calm down the situation. But another point is that last night in Nazareth, a mixed Israeli town, mm -hmm. a mixed Arab and Jewish population, there were demonstrations probably incited by extremists, but nevertheless, this is one sign that the October demonstrations, the October riots of 15 years ago mm -hmm. could be back if the situation gets out of hand in the territories and uh, in the West And Bank. just remind our audience what happened uh, 15 years ago at these protests. Um, in October of 2000, uh, Israeli Arabs uh, also demonstrated uh, prostate, protesting the death of uh, scores mm -hmm. of their brethren in the uh, West Bank and uh, in East Jerusalem. And when the Israeli security forces fired at them, 12 Israeli Arabs were, were killed, as was one Israeli who was killed by Israeli Arabs. And um, this um, uh, also signals that the, the built-in tension in the mixed communities, also in Jaffa, where we are uh, speaking from, yeah. but, in, but in Jaffa, up to now, nothing has flared up, probably uh, because uh, some uh, calmer heads prevailed. But uh, again, in, in Akko, in Nazareth, and in other places along the, the uh, uh, Wadi Ara area, this could come back to haunt us. There is a fear that history could repeat itself with returns of uh, violence. But, but also, looking at the military options, some ministers in Israel are obviously calling for action. And one even hinted at a further military operation in the West Bank. What would that look like, and is well, it likely? The, these ministers, um, uh, some of uh, Netanyahu's own Likud party and mm -hmm. some to the right of it in the Jewish Home Party, are totally ignorant of history, recent history, because uh, the offensive shield in uh, April, late March and early April of 2002 was an operational victory for Israel, but a strategic defeat, because following it, then President Bush was the first American president to come out for an independent Palestinian state. Because of 
this tie-in between political ends and military means, Israel has no need and uh, there is no, no utility in going back into the centers of the Palestinian cities, uh, which are now under the control of Abbas and his security forces. Uh, also, the current chief of staff of the Israeli Defense Forces, General Eisenkot, mm -hmm. wants to prepare the Israeli military for clashes in Lebanon or in Gaza. He doesn't need this surge. If there are four battalions, as Netanyahu said, um, which have been taken out of their uh, regular duties in order to uh, bolster the security in the West Bank and around Jerusalem, it means four battalions less in the preparation for a real clash. Mm -hmm. If this is true, this is a Palestinian victory. So and plus, the, Israeli the, 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 Palestinian, sure. the Israelis are concerned that uh, Abu Mazen don't give back the keys to the Israelis that do, will administrate uh, uh, the West Bank. And any uh, big operation of the uh, Israeli army in uh, Region uh, A will mean immediately the implementation of Abu Mazen's speech, not by the uh, Palestinians, but by the uh, Israelis that will say that uh, also uh, Zone A uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, Palestinian uh, authority is under uh, Israel uh, control, which will mean uh, this time the real effective end of the uh, Oslo agreement. But there is one positive aspect of this uh, surge. In order to forestall escalation, mm -hmm. because escalation would bring people killed, funerals, more demonstrations, more uh, people killed, and uh, this will probably spiral out of control. It really but seems again, this is that that every for every death on each side seems to come another on the other side. So it it, it really seems like there's no end at some point. In yes, it. but there is a difference because on the Israeli side, um, if the authorities do not allow individuals or private movements mm -hmm. to operate, this is all under central control. On the Palestinian side, Abbas cannot control each and every Palestinian who, as Ali said, they are Israeli residents, they are not even citizens, they do not enjoy full rights. And uh, we just saw overnight that when um, some of the perpetrators were from the Jerusalem area, the Israeli authorities demolished their homes, while had there been a Jewish terrorist with an Israeli citizenship, this would not have happened uh, under um, Israeli law. So uh, there is basic discrimination in the way the authorities deal with similar situations, and this again fuels the well, resentment is, of the population. A, and this is the major frustration uh, for the Palestinians. This is what we're hearing a lot. But, but Ali, how, how are people reacting in the Arab world, leaders in particular, to the events here? Well, for the moment, uh, uh, the Arab world is uh, condemning. It is true, uh, Mary did that for the uh, um, Arab world. There are more um, important issues uh, right now, the Syrian one, the Yemenite, uh, etc. But until uh, like 24 hours or 48 hours when the, the central of the uh, problem well, was the uh, Haram al-Sharif, the Al-Aqsa uh, mosque, and not clashes in the, uh, in the street, there was unanimity also among the uh, uh, Arab uh, leaders that the uh, Israelis uh, should stop and that there should be uh, measures to be uh, uh, taken out. The uh, Jordanian uh, king said that the, the uh, Haram al-Sharif is the uh, red line of the uh, Jordanians and that uh, Jordan uh, might be uh, considering uh, steps, uh, unprecedented uh, steps, in order to uh, stop the Israeli uh, aggression. Mm -hmm. And in the last uh, videos that the uh, Islamic State or al-Nusra uh, Front uh, published for the first time since the uh, Syrian uh, civil war in their videos, they were mentioning Bait al-Maqdis, Jerusalem, which means that if the issue of Jerusalem, and, espe and especially the issue of the, uh, uh, the mosque, will be in the center of the, um, of the, the agenda of these uh, uh, organizations, and we are hearing uh, here and there that the Israeli uh, security forces are dismantling uh, Daesh cells inside the, uh, the Arab community of Israel and inside the Palestinian uh, community of uh, uh, of East uh, Jerusalem. Uh, this is a very uh, delicate uh, situation, and I think around the uh, Haram al-Sharif can be uh, the next confrontation between uh, Israelis and Palestinians, but I'm afraid this time it won't uh, uh, stop between Israelis and Palestinians, and when we have uh, jihadist uh, uh, groups in the uh, Syrian uh, borders, in uh, Lebanon, and also a very uh, um, strong uh, presence in, in Jordan, I think that 
uh, political and diplomatic uh, steps should be implemented very uh, quickly yes, in order sure. to try to calm the situation. But, but uh, Netanyahu has matured on one point. 18 years ago, this season, around the Israeli uh, high holidays, uh, he tried to assassinate Khaled Marshall in Amman, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Now he is pointing uh, the finger at Salah Haruri as the mastermind behind the Hamas attacks, but Aruri is uh, in Turkey, another delicate uh, so-called neighbor of Israel, and now Netanyahu doesn't try to uh, anger Erdogan by assassinating Aruri in Turkey yet, mm -hmm. as we are speaking. Interesting point and there, speaking, but we, we do want to take another angle on this. Uh, fight, besides the fighting on the ground, much of the battle between Israel and the Palestinians takes place over the media. So Ami Kaufman is with us to see how the story is being covered across the world. Well, not really totally across the world. I mean, actually, you know, Israelis have this odd uh, craving to know how they are uh, portrayed mm -hmm. across the world, especially when these kind of things break out. And uh, I hate to break it to the Israelis, but they're uh, based on how, you know, my non-scientific survey of the various home pages and internet and news, uh, the world isn't really paying that much attention to what's going on right now in Jerusalem, especially in the last 24, 36 hours. But maybe uh, this, I think this, they this might issue be starting to. This is. I got to tell. I'm going to yeah. break it to you. That we're we're not even on the home page of some of these things. I mean, we're not really? even at the bottom of the home page. It's just people really aren't that interested. But Israelis have latched on to two uh, headlines, shall I say, that got them very, very angry. The first one is from the BBC. Let's take a look at this one. Um, uh, this happened after the attack in Jerusalem in the Old City. Look at the headline. Palestinian shot dead after Jerusalem attack kills two. This was, the, this headline made headlines. This, <laughs> this headline made headlines. Um, actually, the GPO, well, first of all, let's, let's explain, you know, he's, they're giving prominence to the Palestinian uh -huh. that perpetrated the attack, and not really totally, you know, mentioning uh, that, the he two, killed, that he the killed two them Israelis. and that, and that, and that mm -hmm. these two people were the victims of his attack. Yeah. Um, so I mean, did may, you, may, may I just go ahead to check? It's uh, like um, the headline, September 12th, 2001, 19 Arabs exactly. killed as two buildings collapse in Manhattan. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, and 2,000 people die. Would be yeah, after. Right. It's a little less concerned. Yeah. So the GPA, the GPO, the government uh, press mm -hmm. office on Sunday, warned the BBC that it could face sanctions. Uh, it also wrote a letter to Richard Palmer, the head of the BBC bureau uh, in Israel, and, and demands that the BBC apologizes. So Israelis are now waiting for an official apology for the, from the BBC uh, um, for, for this headline. They're but also they did correct the headline. Didn't they corrected it? actually three times the headline, and it wasn't good enough for Israelis. <laughs> three times one. they had the Israeli embassy in London working on this. Our tax shekels going, you know, working very hard for this just to change a few headlines yeah. uh, and uh, they say that they will consider annulling the press cards of BBC journalists um, a decision that if implemented would not allow the network to continue operating in Israel and also mm -hmm. Al Jazeera came under fire let's take a sure. look at what happened Actually, with Al Jazeera unfortunately, we don't have time for that we, one, have time for that. Okay. we will see you for the press review shortly I mean thanks so much for this Amir Oren and Ali Wankid thank you all for being here thank so coming much. up next Russia comes under fire for its activity in Syria but first stay with us for more of the morning's headlines Welcome back. It's still Tuesday, October 6, 2015. This is still the morning edition on I-24 News. Thank you for staying with us. Let's say good morning again to Ami Kaufman, who joins us daily to give us a deeper look at the stories making headlines around the world. Good morning again. Good morning, Meredith. So, uh, we're going to start with Afghanistan and mm -hmm. that hospital that was run by Doctors Without Borders in the province of Kunduz uh, that was bombed by the Americans and uh, 22 people were killed. Now the Americans are saying that the, it was the Afghans, the Afghan uh, forces who asked for a strike at that hospital. We have a report about it. Let's check it out. See. There are so many unanswered questions about this attack, but this is what we know. Last Tuesday, with fierce fighting in the streets, Doctors Without Borders reminds the U.S. and others of the grid coordinates for its hospital, which should then be marked a restricted zone for pilots in the area. But Saturday, just after 2 a.m., the hospital says they were attacked from the air again and again. There were flames all around me, said this survivor. I saw patients and doctors burned to death. 
Defense Secretary Ash Carter said Saturday the U.S. did launch airstrikes after U.S. forces came under Taliban fire in the area. But today, the head of the U.S. and coalition forces says it was Afghan troops who made the request. An airstrike was then called to eliminate the Taliban threat, and several civilians were accidentally struck. General Campbell said he could provide no further detail about the investigation or why the pilots fired. One of the critical questions to be answered in this case is whether the information about the location of the hospital, the restricted zone, actually got to the pilots or anyone else coordinating the strikes. Martha Raddatz, ABC News, Washington. So a bit of the blame game going on now. Oh, yeah. And a lot of uh, blaming, of course, coming from Doctors Without Borders, who put out uh, this uh, following uh, say a statement. Their description of the attack of the Americans, of the attack, keeps changing from collateral damage to a tragic incident to now attempting to pass responsibility to the Afghanistan government. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Americans Doing still have... Doing all they can to cover their... Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's go off to uh, Syria. Uh, things are really heating up between uh, the West and Russia, who has started its uh, bombing campaign in Syria. Now NATO, as we can see here, is warning Russia on airstrikes. Moscow says it's targeting the Islamic State and other Islamic, uh, Islamist positions, but the U.S.-led uh, allies, NATO and Turkey, mm -hmm. say that government opponents uh, are targeted. And yesterday, Turkish F-16 fighter jets uh, were scrambled after a Russian plane, a plane entered Turkey's airspace on uh, Saturday. And actually, John Kerry said that the uh, Turks had every right uh, to shoot the jets down. Mm -hmm. That didn't happen, but uh, things are getting very tense, and I think uh, we better keep an eye on that, seeing yeah. that, you know, with all those jets in the air, very different, you know, forces, um, things could get out of hand and spiral uh, very quickly. Even, yeah, you know, we, things are bad enough as they are uh, to begin with. But we spoke to a journalist on the ground yesterday uh, in Istanbul who, who reminded us that uh, the Turkey, it's, it gets 60 percent or something, or 70 percent of its natural gas from Russia. So there's a lot of other oh, yeah. uh, interests at stake here. So it, it's, it's tough when, with regard to taking action. And what that the would the really Russians mean. are obviously there for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and staying with the Syria, another headline, uh, ISIS uh, blew up the uh, Arch of Triumph, as we can see from this picture. I, mean, I think we have some footage of what it looked like before. This is pretty much the most famous artifact uh, in Palmyra. A uh, 2,000-year-old uh, arch dates back to the uh, Roman Empire. It was built uh, in uh, commemoration of a visit uh, by the emperor and his entourage when uh, Palmyra was a Roman colony. This, of course, comes after uh, uh, um, some other things were destroyed. So there's the Temple of Bel, which was once the center of religious life in uh, Palmyra and the very historic temple of Baal Shamin. But more importantly, it, it also comes after the uh, horrible, horrible beheading mm -hmm. of uh, Khaled al-Assad. He was pretty much the well, the most well-known archaeologist. Uh, they call him the, they call him the father mm -hmm. of Palmyra. He was an 80-year-old man. He was uh, beheaded anyone. a few months ago yeah. uh, by ISIS because he refused to pass on the uh, location of some uh, hidden artifacts that he was uh, mm -hmm. hiding from uh, from ISIS. So it's Bad news area. coming it's from Palmyra. It's so devastating just seeing them, you know, picking away right. at that area. And, and, and what can the world do about it? Well, they're not doing anything, really. Yeah. Well, I, I guess you say Russia's doing something, but depends on whose side you're on, right? Absolutely. Volkswagen, my favorite story. Um, <laughs> now <laughs> it looks like they've... Oh, boy. <laughs> it looks like uh, 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 Volkswagen has found its scapegoat. Mm. Now, I want to remind people that they're doing their own internal investigation. Uh, n nothing from the outside, and they're zeroing in on two engineers. Um, those now, poor souls. Those poor souls. <laughs> now, these are, really, uh, to, to their uh, credibility, I will say they are very high-ranking engineers. Ulrich Hackenberg, if I, I hope I'm not butchering these people's names, is Audi's chief engineer, and Wolfgang Hatz, he's the developer of Porsche's Formula One and uh, Le Mans racing engine. So these are pretty, you know, high-ranking engineers. But uh, uh, they, they were also the people that were closest to the CEO, the former CEO who just resigned. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so it looks like Volkswagen is trying to find two uh, culprits, shall I say, yeah. to probably put this thing behind them. Of course. I'm hoping that this will not uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> go into that direction. And I hope, you know, uh, they're, they're going to lose a lot of money. Uh, I think they're because slated to lose a, a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. Sticking with another company in trouble, Air France. So some p amazing pictures that we're gonna, I'm going to show you. Uh, Air France uh, 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 um, executives held a meeting yesterday, um, uh, and uh, they were going to approve this uh, plan, a restructuring plan that was involving 2,900 uh, redundancies That's between now cuts. and 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, this proposed uh, job losses involve uh, 1,700 ground staff, 900 cabin crew, oh and 300 gosh, pilots, and the uh, uh, workers. Uh, uh, stormed the meeting. That's what they, wow. See that man without a shirt? That's one of the executives. Here's another one. 
uh, with, <gasps> almost with his uh, shirt torn. They, the, about 100 employees stormed this meeting Whoa. and dragged these people out and tore their shirts off. I mean, considering this is, uh, the anger and the, the amount of people there, that's, I mean, they're lucky to have just gotten away with only their shirts, you know, <laughs> damaged. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look at that. That's it's pretty, pretty terrifying. It's shameful that they had to get, you know, they had to resort to violence. Of course, uh, everybody is condemning it from the uh, French Prime Minister all the way down to the union leaders themselves mm -hmm. in Air France. Oh, they're wow. condemning their, uh, you know, their uh, union people their that should actions. not have done this. Mm -hmm. uh, so pretty, you know, amazing photograph. It's a bit here. surprising for France, something that that's shocking, these pictures. You think so? A what, you bit. think the French can't be a little barbaric I sometimes? I don't know. I wonder if it was this female CEO, then, you know, what would have Oh, happened? yeah, that would have been... <laughs> yeah, I would, I would hope that they would not, you know, do yeah. something like that to her. But. And lastly, I just want to finish with also one of my favorite, Donald Trump. Oh, Donald yes. Trump. Thank uh, you for so, bringing him in here today. <laughs> he gave an interview to the New York Times, and he said that uh, uh, he sees, a, as we can see from this headline, he sees a collapse in the GOP campaign without him if he decides not to run for some kind of reason. I, I just want to quote him because it's a great quote. Uh -huh. There'd be a major collapse of the race, and there'd be a major collapse of television ratings, he said. Uh, it would become a depression in television. He you know, said that I a presidential like... campaign without him would become so boring <laughs> that he would struggle to pay any attention to it. I wouldn't even be watching it, probably, he said, and neither would anybody else. I, he's right. He's yeah. totally <laughs> right. I mean, he's totally right as a journalist. It's a, it's a pleasure covering it is, this I, campaign. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's admit, really fun. It's I mean, fun. he's unpredictable. He generates headlines. Mm -hmm. He can be humorous. He can be shocking. <laughs> it would be boring. But I yeah. wonder why he's talking about this. He's talking about this to the New York Times. And on Meet the Press on uh, NBC, just the day before he said that you know if my numbers drop I will go out of the race and go back to my business so twice that he's talking about this possibility that yeah. things might be coming to an end right. even though even though in the two polling states Iowa and New Hampshire the first two polling states he is leading a very comfortable lead above everybody else though. Mm -hmm. Well, he does seem like a sore loser, so. <laughs> <laughs> if I'm not number one, I'm not running at all. That's right. <laughs> I need this a guarantee the number here. number one first wonder of yeah. the yeah. elections, Donald <laughs> Trump. Yeah. Amazing. It's amazing. the Republicans. It's, it's amazing. Like, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty funny. But yeah. we still have some time to go, and yeah, his, his bowls dipped a little bit this week, so we'll, we'll see how Slight that ends up. Dip. Slightly. But, Slight uh, dip. But uh, he's still strong. Ben Carson, is, you know, the first top, you know, the three, the top three leaders, uh, him, Ben Carson, and Carla Fiorita in the Republican field are all non-establishment uh, 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 people. They, they are not, they have no governing experience That's whatsoever. Crazy. The top three people. And Jeb yeah. Bush, the first guy, you know, he's far, far behind. So mm -hmm. that, that really shows that Republicans are really tired yeah. of their establishment they candidates. They want a real change. Top three they want people. something fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Well, Ami, thank you for, for this uh, interesting press review. Uh, and uh, also we're joined, as we've yeah. heard, from Natera Ahitu for our environmental news. Yes. So what's so the latest from this standpoint? I'm also going to talk about two giant companies that are uh -huh. going to pay a lot of money. The mm -hmm. uh, first one is Shell. We mentioned it before in one sentence in one pro uh, program, but let's talk about like the whole story. Now we yeah. have all the facts and the pictures. So Shell started um, drilling in the Arctic in Alaska uh, with the consent of Mr. President Obama, who is considered environmentalist, mm -hmm. but he gave this consent, saying it, it's a really important source of energy. And uh, after a couple of months of no success, they uh, just announced last week that they are stopping the drilling. They're going to close the, the well and get out of there, uh, you know, to the applause of all the environmentalists who were protesting this whole time and saying that this will be, it could be the biggest disaster in the world because mm -hmm. if there is an oil spill in the Arctic, because of the ice and the temperatures, mm -hmm. it could be, it could last there forever yeah. yeah even bigger than the gulf of mexico that we will talk about soon so everybody is very happy about it and they and shell you know obama was recently on a visit to alaska wasn't yeah, he yeah exactly this exactly kind of yeah sparked pressure or yeah. yeah so obama can still be considered environmentalist mm -hmm. in a way because there was no you know finding of any oil and no actual drilling it was only exploratory drilling okay uh, so i guess he's also maybe he's happy or he's off the hook yeah, yeah. exactly yeah <laughs> I mean, they were calling him a hypocrite for that yeah, yeah. going exactly. to alaska and uh, yeah. campaigning for for environment and then approving something like like this yeah. kind of drilling yeah. is and giving of, the yeah. mountain a new name you know mm -hmm. and like <laughs> loving the country and then yeah. you know yeah, yeah approving that so he's off the hook as you've said okay. and another <laughs> Amazing thing is that uh, the biggest 
ever sum paid by one entity in compensation of environmental or in compensation of anything 20.8 billion dollars wow. bp british petroleum the anglo dutch the anglo sorry yeah. the anglo dutch is the last one is shell the anglo company is going to pay the united states for the gulf of mexico oil spill that happened in 2010 uh, wow, and caused amazing. damage to the you know to the environment five states it's really 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 huge and uh, everybody is also very happy about it and mm -hmm. um, you know the katarina hurricane they yeah. they had a lot of damage so now they're hoping to use this money in order to fix some of the damages and yeah because i was going to say i mean it, yeah it, it, it's 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 a great gesture but at the same time the damage was done so exactly. so what is going to be what is this money going to so be it's for, for uh, marine reserves mm -hmm. for um offshore reserves for um, all the damages, mm -hmm. cleaning the oil, cleaning all the beaches there. So there's uh, still a yeah, lot of building residue and, and exactly. damage still felt today. Rebuilding tourism and fishing, big mm -hmm. industries that were there and you know, were really, really hit by yeah. the mm -hmm. oil spill. Well, let's so this that is money something really, really is used big. For, for good and, uh, and that they get this uh, rolling. It's just, mm -hmm. ugh, these images are hard to look at. Yeah, it's very hard to, to look see. at. I remember that. That yeah. was a, a tough, tough time. Yeah, we are five years afterwards, and now there are some um, uh, results from research that have been done about the net, the damage, and mm -hmm. now we really know, you know, this species of fish has been damaged like that and that, and this species uh -huh. of birds have been. So you can really aim the money into specific programs of mm -hmm. rehabilitating the area. Absolutely. Well, so that's good. That is good news. Yes. Yeah, we have a lot of good news. Uh, yes, actually. today, today I'm totally a lot optimistic. Of the time, you know, your your, <laughs> yeah. your segment is a bit depressing. <laughs> so that's that's great. Yes. <laughs> but and some two more good news. Have, oh, you have more good news. Yes. I'm like I'm like really yes, this yes. is great. Okay. <laughs> this weekend saw uh, marches for and in favor of animals all over the world in Johannesburg, London, and Toronto. People were marching in favor of rhinos, elephants, and lions to oh, stop wow. poaching and calling the governments to do something mm -hmm. and really demand action. Also in Tel Aviv, there was the biggest march for animals ever happened. 10,000 people marched in the streets of Tel Aviv on oh. Saturday mm -hmm. uh, to That's call, yeah, it's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Yeah. To, for, or this is for farm animals mm -hmm. and stray cats, stray dogs, you know, the animals that we live around. And uh, yeah, so many, many people are walking in the streets of many great. cities around the world in favor of animals. And, and I love the face paint. I mean, yeah. yeah. And we salute <laughs> them. Great <laughs> images coming from there. And another amazing <laughs> piece of news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> in Chile, there was a really big conference. It's called Our Ocean Conference. It deals with you know the ocean, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there are scientists, businessmen, politicians from all over the world. John Kerry, you know, was there. And the the Chilean president Michelle Bachelet uh, announced uh, the biggest marine reserve in Chile that is going to help also the local community, the indigenous around it, but also um, 27 species of fish and mammals and um, seabirds that live there. Wow. And this is really big and this is a part of a, a whole approach, new approach by leaders. Chile is now joining New Zealand, the States, Britain that also announced marine reserve. People understand governments, you know, high rank people understand that this is the way we can save our seas and mm -hmm. the fish because we are overfishing and we are over exploding the sea. Mm -hmm. Lots of pollution is causing exactly. the, you know, the, the depths of coral reefs and exactly. populations. So one big uh, um, subject that they were, were discussing mm -hmm. there was also pollution from, uh, from the shore sure. and how to deal with it. You know, we are uh, throwing 8 million tons of plastic every day to the sea, every day every we're talking day? about. Yeah. Oh and um, the sea is food source for, you know, everybody. It's also a, for the global warming. It's very important. Mm -hmm. So they were all talking about it. It was really nice that John Kerry was there mm -hmm. talking not only, you know, politics, but also right. environmentalism. Well, yeah. this was overall very cheery. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is great. This is great. Great news for the environment. And so yes. thank you so much for thank this. Thank you. And uh, so that's all for today's show. Join us again tomorrow, same time, same place, for more of the Morning Edition. Stay tuned for more of this morning's headlines. Thank you.